If there's one thing that's been constant in technology over the years, it's the pursuit of miniaturization and integration. The IBM 350 disk storage unit, the first disk drive introduced in 1956, had a capacity for 3.75 megabytes and was made up of 50 24-inch disks and contained in a cabinet almost the size of a small car. It cost $3,000 a month to rent. By 1980, the first 5.25-inch drive was introduced by Seagate with a whopping 5 megabytes of storage. It was hundreds of times smaller than the IBM 350. Last year, Huawei launched a nano memory card, which is about 45% smaller than a micro SD card, with up to 256 gigabytes of capacity. Over the decades, we've seen the same scaling happening with personal computers, mobile phones, and of course with the transistor itself. With 7 nanometers this year and the 6 nanometer and 5 nanometer process nodes coming into production next year, GPU chips are also getting smaller, with the 5700 XT being capable of 4K AAA gaming at a fraction of the size of the comparable 1080 Ti. Renoir, AMD's upcoming 7 nanometer APUs, which succeed the current 12 nanometer Picasso ones, should bring exceptional performance for 1080p gaming, but it's the successor to it, Rembrandt, that could finally bring to mind market an APU that could eliminate the need for dedicated gaming GPUs altogether. Before we discuss Ram Brown, I want to go over some of the leaks regarding Zen 3 that have come out recently, so bear with me for a couple of minutes. Over the past month, several rumors have indicated that AMD plans to bring SMT4 to next year's Zen 2 successor, Zen 3, so that's 4 threads per core instead of 2. As app developers make better use of multi-threading, it certainly makes sense for more threads per core to become common, but will Zen 3 be the architecture to bring this to the Mainstream. One of the first rumors that came out regarding SMT4 in Zen 3 was from Tom over at the Moore's Law is Dead YouTube channel. I'll have a link in the description to his video if you haven't watched it. A few other sources since have suggested the same, with others contradicting the same rumors. Others still are saying that SMT4 was indeed in AMD's plans, but they decided not to go ahead with it due to various factors. The reality is, no one knows for sure, but the recent accident dental leak at the HPC and AI Innovators Insights AMD talk gives us an indication that SMT4 probably won't be happening anytime soon. Or will it? To understand why AMD would want to have SMT4 available in their chips, we should first try and understand how simultaneous multi-threading works and what the benefits of 4 threads per core would be. On the surface, the concept of multi-threading is very simple. If you have a 4-core CPU and you run one thread, you are only using a small portion of the CPU's processing capacity. But if you run four threads simultaneously, you are getting four times as much work done per time unit. But what if your processor is so powerful that each thread that you are running is not even taking full advantage of each core's potential? If we could have even more threads running per core, we could use its full potential rather than wasting processing power, right? This is the idea behind simultaneous multi-threading, where you can run two threads or more inside of each core in order to take full advantage of its capacity. If code is optimized to run in a multi-threaded CPU, then an application can run faster and the CPU can be more efficient. But things get more complex once you actually understand what happens inside a core when two threads are running simultaneously. A CPU is composed of various units like the ALUs, the caches, floating point units, branch predictors, and other execution units and so on. When a thread is running in a core, it's using these resources to perform different types of computation. So it might trigger the fetch of data from cache, use it to perform operations in various execution units, and then write data back in a table in the cache. If you have two threads running in the core simultaneously, you can run into a bottleneck like resource contention. So if a thread needs to access the execution units but another thread is using them, the thread must wait until the first has stopped using all instances of this resource at a given time. This means that there is a potential stall even in an out-of-order system if, for instance, there is a dependency chain for that first thread. 
Alternatively, if a resource is statically shared, meaning that half of it goes to one thread and the other half goes to another, it will then be equally divided between the two threads. This means each thread will only have access to half of the total number of units. As you can imagine, this means you are reducing the maximum potential performance of a thread if the maximum utilization of a resource is capped. Sounds confusing? In short, not only there is no benefit to SMT in this case, there could actually be lower overall performance. But then you might ask, if this is the case, then wouldn't all threads suffer from these bottlenecks? Well, the thing is, threads can stall because of bottlenecks elsewhere in the system, not necessarily because of things that are happening inside of the core. For instance, let's say a thread when accessing memory has a lot of cache misses. This thread will have to waste a lot of time waiting until the data it needs is fetched from system memory outside of the chip. While this thread is waiting for that, another thread can be using the available caches or the execution units, therefore maximizing the core's overall utilization at a given time. In these cases, each thread will run at more than half speed, giving us an overall speed improvement. This is why our current CPUs with SMT2 generally perform better than the ones without SMT. But remember, just because we are running two threads instead of one doesn't mean that we get double the performance in each core. There's always a bottleneck somewhere. With SMT, we might get an improvement of 25% or a bit more, but never double or anywhere close to that. Now, what would happen in Zen 3 if each core had four threads instead of two, as some rumors have suggested? As you can probably guess, the problem of resource contention becomes much more severe when you have that many threads competing for resources inside of the core. If multiple threads need to use a multiply unit at the same time and only one can use it, the others have to wait. So you are now running the processor at only 25% capacity, while the remaining 75% could be stalling, waiting for a resource to become available. Out of order systems minimize this problem, but dependency chains are inevitable and there will be times when there's contention for resources from all four four threads. In short, this means that SMT4 would result in performance decreases in many desktop applications. Now you might be thinking, what if AMD could disable SMT4 when an application isn't optimized to take advantage of it? Well, that would be great. For instance, while you were gaming and doing nothing else, if the game saw a performance penalty by using SMT4, the system could just disable it and run with SMT2, or even with no SMT. Unfortunately, as you probably know, this is not how things work. First of all, Windows isn't sophisticated enough to do that on its own, and it's unrealistic for developers to flag the system for every possible hardware configuration, be it no SMT, SMT2, or 4, etc. No developer is going to be testing their code against all possible CPU configurations, and then adding extra logic to enable and disable SMT as needed. And even if they did, Currently, there is no way of preventing Windows from using the idle threads to do something else. There are always processes running in the background in Windows, and it will utilize idle threads to do so, again splitting internal core resources that would otherwise be running at full speed. So after that lengthy explanation, you might start to understand why bringing SMT4 to the desktop is probably not a great idea at this point. Another way to prevent resource contention inside the core would be of course to add more cores. If everyone had 64 core CPUs, and if Windows scheduled applications in such a way that each application could have its own cores exclusively, then SMT4 could represent a performance increase in the applications that took advantage of it, and no performance penalty in the ones that didn't. But not everyone will have 64 cores anytime soon, and Windows simply doesn't work like that. And unfortunately, Microsoft doesn't seem to interested in improving Windows for many core CPUs. They have better things to do. Now, this analysis of multi-threading is obviously biased towards the desktop user, but things are different when it comes to hyperscalers and HPC. When I first heard of the rumors of Zen 3 having SMT4, my first reaction was that the server parts would be separate designs from the consumer ones in Zen 3, because SMT4 or higher can indeed be beneficial for server CPUs. You see, for hyperscalers like Amazon, it's more important 
to have throughput than raw single threaded speed. What matters to Amazon is being able to perform more transactions per time unit. This means they will develop specialized applications that can take advantage of four or even eight threads per call if they can minimize any other resource bottlenecks. <laughs> and guess what? Amazon has a lot of money and they will buy as many CPUs as you can throw at them if the throughput benefits are there. To me, it makes perfect sense for AMD to have a processor with SMT4 available for these hyperscalers like Amazon and Facebook and Google. And the same is true for HPC. Supercomputers, more than any other type of computing system, run very specialized applications and usually highly parallel ones. And with custom operating systems, having the ability to control if SMT is enabled or disabled is much more attainable in a closed system. So in summary, SMT4 does make sense provided a few conditions are met. As we just discussed, this is especially true for hyperscalers and HPC workloads. So AMD can simply segment Zen 3 and have SMT4 only available in the server parts or even in only a few Milan SKUs. The leaked slide from the Innovator Insights video does only state SMT2, but I wouldn't take that as the final word on the matter. Why? We know that Milan will be on 7 nanometer plus, and you can see in the slide legend it states 7 nanometer plus as the node example. Yet the graph for Milan shows 7 nanometers instead. The TDP range is also the same, even though AMD has said they are expecting efficiency gains with 7 nanometer plus. So I wouldn't put too much faith in this slide as being the final word on Milan. Seems to me like this was a rushed edit on that slide, and this is the information that AMD wanted to disclose at this point, but it's possible that things like SMT4 and support for DDR5, for instance, will be added to Zen 3. To me, this slide doesn't rule that out completely. As far as the desktop chips are concerned, however, for the reasons I discussed, I doubt we will see SMT4 anytime soon. I think it's more likely that Zen 4 will be the one to have SMT4 available for server parts, but I wouldn't discard that on Zen 3 just yet. The second thing that was disclosed regarding Milan in the leaked Innovators Inside video is that the CCD will now have a unified cache, meaning all eight cores share the same pool of cache. Presumably AMD will get rid of the notion of CCX in Zen 3. So let me touch very briefly on why this decision was made and what it will mean for performance. So the first question is, why is the cache split in Zen 2 to begin with? I suspect that this has to do with single threaded performance. The fact that these cores have a smaller pool of cache shared between them means that there's less data movement when fetching and storing data in the cache, assuming a system of BCHT tables was used in Rome. Without getting too technical here, the idea is that by keeping the data local to the cores, there's a gain in efficiency and you also get lower latency. I think this was important for single threaded performance versus Intel. For Milan, it's possible that AMD will implement a hashing solution like Horton tables in the cache instead of traditional BCHTs. If you saw my video from a couple of months ago called The Future of Computing Performance, you might remember how I suggested introducing metadata into memory systems as a way for Intel, AMD, and Nvidia to improve performance in future chips. I don't know for sure, obviously, but I'd speculate that this might be something that AMD will do to keep keep latency under control with this larger pool of shared L3. There's also a note there indicating that there will be 32 megabytes or more of cache, which means AMD will use some of the additional density of the 7 nanometer plus node to add a bit more cache per CCD. And I suspect that alongside that extra cache will be extra logic for data locality. This is me just speculating with very little to go by, but it would make sense for for HPC applications to have this larger pool of cache, as the data sets in those applications can be very large. And I don't think AMD would make this change if they hadn't found a way to not compromise the desktop part's performance while doing so. At least that's my interpretation of this, but I could be wrong. 
Now, I see people getting excited about Zen 3, thinking it will be another major leap in performance, but I think recent history has shown that we should probably temper our expectations. I think it's reasonable to expect an IPC gain of about 7% in Zen 3. I know it sounds conservative compared to what others might have suggested, but I think it's a realistic number considering the small increase in density going to 7 nm plus. TSMC projects a 10% performance uplift with 7 nanometer plus or 15% better efficiency. But I doubt that this is for SOCs. As I discussed earlier, in Zen 3 there will also be a significant improvement to the chip's sub-memory system with slightly bigger L3 caches, which means AMD will close the gap in single-threaded performance versus Intel, perhaps even beating them, assuming all of the compounded gains. Maybe DDR5 support will also make it into Zen 3 3, but overall I think Zen 3 will be a refinement of Zen 2 rather than a radical leap forward. I think we can expect about an overall 10% improvement in performance compared to Zen 2. But I hope I'm wrong and that AMD can surprise us. A few days ago, one of my patrons shared a link to a forum thread on Anantac where there was a discussion on AMD's APUs. From there, I found a LinkedIn profile from an AMD employee in India who states he is working on 7 nanometer, 6 nanometer, and 5 nanometer products for AMD, namely Renoir, Rembrandt, and Durango. Now, Renoir is the upcoming 7 nanometer APUs, which will be based on Zen 2 cores with updated Vega graphics. So these are Zen 2 APUs on 7 nanometers. that includes Vega, but with the display engine from Navi. So that's the video encoding and decoding that the RX 5000 series have, and support for lower power DDR4. So Renoir should be really interesting APUs. We also know that there are mobile variants of these 7 nanometer APUs, codenamed DALI. The main difference between Renoir and DALI will be the core count, with DALI going up to 4 cores and Renoir offering APUs up to 8 cores. Back in August, I got access to a report made at Computex with AIBs, and the expectation then was that DALI would be coming out before the end of 2019. Now, seeing as the 5500, the 3950X, and the new Threadrippers have all been delayed, I think it's also likely that Renoir and DALI will be delayed until early 2020. Now, Durango sounds to me like something relating to Microsoft, particularly the next Xbox. It could be the cheaper streaming version. But what really caught my eye, as you might have guessed from the title of this video, was Rembrandt, a codename I hadn't heard before. I asked on Twitter if any of the usual suspects knew anything about it, and no one seems to have heard of this before either. So here's what I think it is. I think Rembrandt is not only a successor to Renoir with actual RDNA 2 graphics, I think think it could be a variant of the work that AMD is doing for consoles, but for the desktop PC market. I don't think that it's a coincidence that the same engineer is working on APUs and console chips. Sounds to me like these are connected. It makes sense for AMD to have a scaled down chip similar to the one that's going into the next Xbox, but available as a standalone APU. I imagine this will skip 7 nanometer plus and be produced on 5 nanometers instead. It's also possible to come out on 6 nanometers, which is a compatible process with regular 7 nanometers, but I think 5 nanometers is more likely. 5 nanometers already, you might ask. In a future video, I might explore the relationship between TSMC and AMD, but suffice it to say that contrary to what you might think, TSMC does have a say on what nodes AMD chooses for their products, but that's a story for another day. So this Rembrandt AP would be coming to market in late 2020 or early 2021. While the next generation consoles will be coming out in the second half of next year, it makes sense for AMD to wait until the consoles have had their sales bonanza in the 2020 holiday period and launch Rembrandt a few months later as not to interfere with the console sales. So the AMD major SoC launches for the next 15 months or so would look something like this. Ryzen 4 
4000 U and 4000 H in just a few months, in late 2019 or early 2020, Zen 3 based Ryzen 4000 desktop chips, codenamed Vermeer, about a month after Computex next year, the PS5 and Xbox Scarlet in October, and then the Rembrandt APUs just a couple of months after that. Performance wise, we've seen how good the 5700 series is with such a small die size. If Rembrandt comes out on 5 nanometers, which I think it will, we could see a similar level of performance to the 5700 on an APU. But what about memory bandwidth, you might ask? There's no way an APU could ever reach that level of performance without the bandwidth that discrete GPUs have, not to mention the power consumption, right? Well, not only could it have the bandwidth, it could even have lower latency than discrete GPUs, and 5 nanometers offers considerable efficiency gains. Recently, I was watching a presentation on the A64FX chip, codenamed Fugaku, which has been developed by Riken in conjunction with Fujitsu for the Japanese government. It will be the brain inside the post-K exascale supercomputer that Japan is currently deploying. If you've been following my recent videos, you might remember that I talked about how packaging in chips will evolve in the next two years to feature on-package memory and other components for a true heterogeneous system. The A64FX features four stacks of HBM2 in a 2.5D package, as you can see here. Now this is 7 nanometers. The peculiar thing about this chip is that it behaves both as a general purpose CPU, but also as a GPU, even though it doesn't have integrated graphics. Once CPUs start to have a memory subsystem similar to GPUs, with something like a terabyte per second bandwidth, and as we get more and more cores in these SOCs, the line between CPU and GPU will start to blur. Now, I'm not suggesting that Rembrandt will be anything as sophisticated as this, but having on-package HBM is a real possibility. On 5 nanometers, if the chip looks something like this, we could have a monolithic APU similar to the ones on consoles, with really high performance capabilities in a tiny package. It could also be chipless based, so something like this, although the latency here would probably hold the graphics performance back somewhat. I think the most likely scenario will be for AMD to have both implementations at some point, a monolithic one and a chiplet space design with the GPU chiplet in place of a CPU one. Regardless of the implementation, I'm going to speculate that Rembrandt might be the true Voltron chip that could make 4K gaming affordable without the need for large dedicated GPUs. With these new sharpening and scaling effects gaining popularity, and with the prices of discrete GPUs going up, I think APUs could be the future of PC gaming and make the platform a lot more accessible to a lot more people. And it's not just me saying this. A report on Digitimes quotes sources from the PC supply chain saying the following. Asus gaming PC shipments doubled on year in 2017, but the growth dipped to only 71% in 2018 and dropped further to 37% in the first quarter of 2019. For the long term, with cloud computing service providers such as Google and Apple launching game streaming services, allowing users to play games without the need of purchasing top-notch hardware, demand for gaming PCs is also expected to be undermined, especially with the commercialization of 5G. Of course, this transition to APUs won't happen overnight, just like it took a while for hard drives to go from the size of a car with only 3 megabytes down to the size of a fingernail with hundreds of gigabytes of capacity. Or perhaps I'm completely wrong and APUs have no future. <laughs> Let me know what you think in the comments below. My patrons get exclusive access to sessions on computer architecture as well as access to the Cortex Discord server, which has a really healthy and welcoming community of enthusiasts like you and me. So join my Patreon today. If you can't contribute financially at this point, then please share this video on social media as that really helps. Thanks for watching and until the next one.